being born of. Being born of. Okay. Ajashve jati bhutani bhutatma yat anugrahat dadrashe jinatad rupam nabipadma samud babaha. Okay, next slide, number four. Translation. We broke it up here. Brahma, who was not born of a material source, but of the lotus flower coming out of the navel abdomen of the Lord, is the creator of all those who are materially born. Of course, by the grace of the Lord, Brahma was able to see the, see the form of the Lord. Here's a Pete. Brahma. Brahma. Who was not born of a material source. Who was not born of a material source. Material source. But of the lotus flower. But of the lotus flower. Coming out of the navel abdomen of the Lord. Coming out of the navel abdomen of the Lord. Is the creator of all those who are materially born. Is the creator of all those who are materially born. Of course. Of course. By the grace of the Lord. By the grace, by the grace of the Lord. Brahma was able to see the form of the Lord. Brahma was able to see the form of the Lord. And here we have a picture of the form of the Lord playing on his flute. Okay. So uh, I think we would go ahead here to number five. Let's so, take that. Okay, Maharaj, I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody now except for you and the dot because he's chair of the screen today. So just give me a minute here. Oh. Okay. Oh, there it goes, yeah. Uh, Bidad Jiji, can you hear me? I guess. Okay. Can you hear us, Vidagda? Well, okay, I guess you can. Okay, so then uh, we're in Chapter 8 here, and we have kind of an overview of the chapter. Uh, verses 1 through 6, where Maharaj uh, Parikshit's prefaces to his questions, why the questions were important, what the, uh, you know, what the effect of the answers would be, uh, you know, what, 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 are, what, what are his qualifications for asking, what are the qualifications of the person of, of whom he's asking. So verses 1 through 6, very common, he sets a little bit of background here. And it's not like, you know, dragging that, just the facts, ma'am. It's just, you got to understand that everything is personal. Okay. Then 7 through 22, which of course is most of the chapter there, uh, he actually asks, asks his questions. And in uh, 23 to 26, then he glorifies the, que the, qu the questioned, he glor glorifies Sukadeva Goswami and the expected answers. So I guess it's like a, a post face. Okay, and 27 to 29, Sukadeva, Sukadeva Goswami prefaces his answers. Okay. Now, if we go ahead here, I think the next slide, number uh, six. Slide number six. Yeah. Now, two, eight, one, the very, very first question was, Mars Pariksit asked, how did Narada Muni explain the transcendental qualities of the Lord after being enlightened by Lord Brahma? You know? So that was, of course, the entire uh, last module want to look at it that way. Uh, module two, uh, uh, the module, yeah, module two, yeah, is Brahma to Narada, about three chapters, and Narada was sufficiently enlightened in so many ways like that, and then of course the conclusion always is, okay, if you understand and haven't got any more questions, now you go explain it to others, you go, you go you know, become a teacher of Bhagavatam also. So of course, it's a very, very natural question, you know, how did uh, Narada Muni explain this after he heard it from Brahma. Way back in the first canto, it's exactly what the, uh, the sages of Naima Sharanya asked. They say, okay, after Narada Muni explained all this to Vyasadeva, how did Vyasadeva expand it? So that then goes into chapter 7 of the first canto and how he, he started all this narration in which we're now involved like that. 
Okay. So 281 is this, this question, how did Narada Muni expand this? And I guess we can look at the, he says, how did he expand it? And specifically, how did he answer these questions? So the questions that he's asking now are, are the questions in terms of what Narada understood. In the purport, Prabhu says, how Narada Muni distributed the transcendental knowledge of the Lord will be explained in later cantos. The people actually asked us, why is Narada Muni featured so much? It's a nice little research project to go through and see uh, how Narada Muni is involved in the Bhagavatam. It's teaching this person, teaching that person, or doing this, doing that. You know? well, maybe this question, of course, is in the basis of why the Bhagavatam is focused, focused that way. Because Maharaj Puriks asked, how can Narada explain it? And Prabhu says, okay, that'll be shown for the rest of cantos. So here we have a, a modern Narada Muni is traveling in outer space. If you, if you see our pictures there. Number seven. Next slide. Okay. So 2.8 is, of course, questions by King Parikshit. And then in, in the end of 2.8, then Sukadeva Goswami gives his little preface there, uh, saying, yes, these are wonderful questions. And in 2.9 is answers by citing the Lord's version. And 2.10 is Bhagavatam is the answer to all questions. So I didn't have a chance to do it, but it would be interesting to see how they, uh, they fit in. Um, we mentioned this before, that Edwaita, I think it is Ed, 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 Edwin Bryant, Professor Edwin Bryant, or, yeah, from, uh, where was he from? Um, some big college, I like a big college, I forgot which one it is now. Uh, not Bryn Mawr, <laughs> something like that. Anyway, he's back at a big college in, in the New York area there. See, he wrote a whole article called the, called the Date and Providence, Providence of the Srimad and Bhagavatam. So I guess Providence is the way of saying maybe the, uh, where it came from. And it's a very, very nice article, excellent article. And he goes over from a very scholarly point of view of when the Bhagavatam was produced and these things. And talking with him and, of course, Radhika Raman, Professor Ravi Gupta, um, we get comments like, very few of the Puranas have commentaries. Uh, but the Bhagavatam has a commentary by everybody, because even big atheists who believe in evolution you know, of matter um, say that the Bhagavatam is the greatest thing in the world. So they want to show how the Bhagavatam all supports their idea. And many of the Puranas will start off with some topic, and without too much rational cause, they'll go to some other topic, and they'll be running around here and there. They'll cut through a couple chapters on gym therapy or something. But the Bhagavatam is very clear in the, what, what it's trying to do, and it develops it very systematically. And again, there's just no literature like the Bhagavatam. And Jiva Goswami in his Sandarbhas, he identifies, of course, Etech Ham Sasakal Pum Sam Krishna's Tu Bhagavan Swayam as the uh, Paribhasa Sutra of the Bhagavatam. But this verse is the, is the controlling verse that it lets us understand why all the material is there. Uh, and the second chap, third chapter, first canto, Sudha Goswami has described so many incarnations, uh, Purusha avatars, Lila avatars, and then he finishes everything off, and he says, Ete cha amsa sakalpum sam Krishna's tu bhagavan swayam. That all these are different portions or plenary portions you know, or limbs of the Supreme uh, Lord, but the original form of the Lord is ba Bhagavan Swayam, is Krishna. So the Bhagavatam is going through systematically, taking us from kind of almost like Upanishadic level of language, um, Adhoksaja, uh, what else, you know, Akhiliyartana, so many kind of very impersonal names for Krishna, he who is everywhere, he who knows everything. It's starting off kind of like an Upanishad, and then gradually becomes more and more intimate with different incarnations until finally it goes 10th canto. So here we see, you know, Mars Parikh is asking these questions, and then the next two uh, chapters are going to be answers. And like I was saying, I, I have, I, 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 as I go through this again and again, I see more and more how there's such a very, very intelligent structure you know, to the Bhagavatam. The questions are being answered, and, and very, very rational reason why Mars Pariksit now asked this question. So I, I'm interested to see how these two, two chapters of answers actually fall in line then with Maharaj Pariksit's questions. If there are any more questions are introduced or if this is falling from these questions. 
Okay, number eight. Okay, 288. And this is the, uh, yesterday's verse. If the Supreme Personality of Godhead, so this is one of his questions. If the Supreme Personality of Godhead, from who, whose abdomen the lotus stem sprouted, is possessed of a gigantic body according to his own caliber and measurement, then what is the specific difference between the, between the body of the Lord and those of common living entities? What is the specific difference between the body of the Lord and those of common living entities? And of course, yesterday this is dealt with very well. Vidagda was also dealing with this too. Yeah. Brahma, who was not born of a material source, but of the lotus flower coming out of the navel of the Lord, yeah, is the creator of all those who are materially born, which is he said before too. Of course, by the grace of, the, of Lord Brahma, of course, by the, by the grace of the Lord, Brahma was able to see the form of the Lord. So this is, these two verses are just the same, you know, part of the same idea here, and pretty much they don't make any sense. Today's verse doesn't make a lot of sense unless you know the previous verse, what's being discussed. Since so Vidagda yesterday was making this point, Vidagda, that, uh, you know, the, the size of the Lord doesn't matter a whole lot. And I was just remembering this kind of little humorous, I suppose he, J, J. Edgar Hoover, a good founder of the FBI, he said, it's, it's, not the ma it's not the size of the dog. It's not the size of the dog in the fight that matters. It's the size of the fight in the dog. <laughs> so, so even the Lord may be a little guy like Bamba Dave, he would really give a big kick to Ravana and send him halfway across the universe, like a little dwarf guy. Okay. So that's kind of the question. You know, if, if the Lord, yesterday's verse is talking about this, that the, the size of the Lord's body is not really all that significant because an ant has his job to do, so he has a little body. You know, an elephant has a bigger job to do, so he does a, a bigger body. And, and just the fact that you know, Mah Mahavishnu has to take care of all the universes, okay, so he has a bigger, bigger body. So the, the size of the body is, just, can be, is only a consideration in terms of what the living entity has to do. So why is the Lord's body uh, different? Is there some other significance to the difference of his body? Okay, let's go to number nine. Okay, slide number nine says, 288 purport. It has been described in many places before this that the Lord assumed a gigantic body like that of Karanadakshai Vishnu, from whose hair pores innumerable universes have generated. Yeah. So this is kind of interesting because you know, all of us have hair, well, most of us, some, some human beings don't sweat. It's kind of an odd, odd genetic thing, but some human beings don't perspire. You know? But most of us, I assume in our audience, all perspire. And if you actually check it out, there's, you know, that, that means there's little, little particles of vapor, you know, of water coming out of your uh, pores also, and my pores and stuff like that and so on. So how small are those? And they're just tiny, you know, tiny. And how many are coming out of our body? And you begin to appreciate, the Vedanta was saying that you know, Mahavishnu's body is inconceivably big. So if, if universes are these in, in, invisible little, little, you know, what I call them, droplets of water coming out of his body, how big is his body? Okay. Then it goes on and says, the body of Garbhadakshai Vishnu is described as sprouting the lotus as stem within which all the planets of the universe remain. And at the top of the stem is the lotus flower on which Lord Brahma is born. Okay, next. We got here number 10. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. The creation of the material world, in the creation of the material world, the Supreme Lord undoubtedly assumes a gigantic body, and living entities also get bodies, big or small, according to necessity. A living being and the Lord cannot be distinguished simply by the difference in the magnitude of the body. So the answer depends upon 
the specific significance of the body of the Lord as distinguished from the body of common living being. And of course, this generates all kinds of things. The different, you know, the uh, what is it? Fifty qualities of, of living entity uh, that they hold in common with, with Krishna. And what is it? Then there's five more or something that Brahma and uh, Shiva have, and then a few more that uh, Vishnu has. And what is it? Four qualities or six that only Krishna has. Special flute player, beautiful childhood pastimes, surrounded by wonderful associates. Madhurya Rupa, Madhurya you know, Venu, uh, beautiful form. Yeah. And also the thing is that his body, of course, is, is meant to create. It's meant for creation of the material world and, and, and to help the living entities. Whereas our body, is, 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 it signifies a desire you know, to become separate, egoistic from everybody and try and become a very, very strange kind of, kind of God. Okay, next slide. Slide number 11. There, there's a delay, Maharaj. I'm sorry about that. It's coming up. Okay. Here. Yeah, it takes hours. That's why I was counting to five. <laughs> One, two, right. three. It's Krishna Chaitanya Prabhupada. Nanda Shri Aveta Gadada Shiva. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the two, eight, eight, nine. Our, our audience just fell off their chair in ecstasy. Gunga Manti here with me. The back of the chair just fell off. Okay, purport. Uh, 289. The first living creature, Brahma, is Aja. Of course, that's in the, uh, in the Sanskrit. Because he did not take his birth from the womb of a mother, materially born. No. He was directly born from the bodily expansion of the lotus flower of the Lord. Thus, it is not readily understandable whether the body of the Lord and that of Brahma are of the same quality or different. This must be clearly understood. So, yes, yeah, the, the question, because then we have to ask, is the lotus flower uh, uh, Satchitananda? Is the lake Satchitananda? I guess when we come to the Lord's navel, we would say, okay, the Lord's navel is pretty much Satchitananda. But what about the, the the lake? You know, what about the river 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 virage? You know, so at some point here, things are changing. You know, from from one energy to another. That's a little curious then. So the natural thing would be that you know the suspected okay, Brahma is directly born without a father and mother, and the, the body of Mahavishnu and Garbhadakshay Vishnu. So therefore, his body might also might be Satchitananda. Well, next slide. Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Vaita Gadada Shri One thing is, however, certain. Brahma was completely dependent on the mercy of the Lord because after his birth he could create living beings, which he's described again and again as being the creator, by the Lord's grace only. And he could see the form of the Lord, and I added here, also by His grace only. Yeah. Whether the form was, whether the form seen by Brahma is of the same quality as that of Brahma is a bewildering question. And Maharaj Pariksit wanted to get clear answers from Srila Sukadeva Goswami. Um, again, this brings up this point that I think it's a little bit difficult for us to understand or appreciate this part of the Bhagavatam, the Bhagavatam sometimes, because our position is that, you know, we all grew up eating hamburgers and hot dogs, and of course, who knows what's in that ground up hamburger meat and in those, in those hot dogs, and there may very well be a few dogs and cockroaches and everything else, you know. So I guess most of us Westerners can all, you know, confess to being dog eaters <laughs> somehow or other, <laughs> yeah. And then and what do we do? And suddenly we're, we're, we're able to relish and appreciate, you know, Chaitanya Charitamrita, which is the, mo the most confidential literature is, you know, available, and understand things that are even inaccessible to Lord Brahma. So this is a, a sublime movement, sublime. It goes from the most gross state to the most elevated, 
and practically speaking, without much in between. So if somebody comes to a, a very, very nice big kirtan with devotees and chanting, he chants, and by the mercy of, of uh, Lord Chaitanya and the, and the Panchatabha, then immediately he can understand with the super soul very, very confidential aspects of spiritual life. So why should he have any interest in grosser things? Yeah? You know, what, why, you know? And of course the idea is that maybe we can't stay in that platform because we have, we're not liberated souls. So we have to go back and engage in the process, you know, regulated chanting of mantras, worshiping the deity, you know. And by this process, then we can purify our, our gross attachments. And then we can stay steady in this realization offered by Lord Chaitanya, you know. So in the beginning, these, these questions by Maharaj Pariksit, Prabhupada says the Bhagavatam starts where the Mahabharata and Bhagavad Gita finish, uh, philosophically and historically. So the Bhagavad Gita is, 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 is Gita Upanishad, is more or less explaining uh, on, on the intellectual platform. So Bhagavatam is starting off with the same kind of very simple questions like this. Is the body of Brahma the same as the body of Vishnu? And you see other questions are kind of very, very, you know, does the Lord create everything by himself or this and that? So they're very, very like Upanishadic questions in the beginning, which for us may not make a lot of sense because for us it's either eat hot dogs, you know, or, or, or else eat, eat kofta, <laughs> have kofta at the Sunday feast or tomato chutney or else eat hot dogs. There's nothing in between, you know. Of course, now things are getting a little bit more, much variety. So these questions are very, very, uh, what's the word, Upanishadic questions and dealing with the Lord from a very, very philosophical point of view, which is good to, to purify our intelligence. Here's my wrap. Let's go and get here. The next slide, number 13. Okay. I guess that, that's the whole purport, kind of small. Okay. 520, uh, 3 through 4. Because see, this is, this is our current Bhakti by Baba studies. We're on the uh, chapter 20 of the fifth canto. And it's kind of showing here, it says, purport, according to general understanding, okay, take a second for it to load, according to general understanding, there are originally three deities, Lord Brahma, Lord, Sh Lord Vishnu, and Lord Shiva. And people with a poor fund of knowledge consider Lord Vishnu no better than Lord Brahma or Lord Shiva. This conclusion, however, is invalid, as stated in the Vedas. And then the, pop, and the purport has all these citations from the Gita, from the Vedas, other things like that. You know? So I kind of brought that up just to show that this is not um, anything, what's the word? It's not anything new, you know, or, or, or what's the word? Uh, indifferent. It's, not a, it's a point that Prabhupada is going to be dealing with again and again. That some people, Prabhupada says, a common a common understanding, according to general understanding. And so many people who have a little contact with the the Indian culture, they say, "Oh yeah, the Indians believe in uh, three gods. What are they? What are they? Yeah." And Peter Brook, Peter Brook, of course, is his Mahabharat, an enormous director, and his whole effort was to try and communicate to uh, Western audiences. You know, this, these world classical literatures. He did, he did Gurdjieff's things, all and everything, but also he did the Mahabharat. And uh, I, I, I like it very much. It's an intense movie. You've got to make some adjustments. But it starts off uh, very, like, kind of very, like, nice, light, mystical music. And then there's a, a big crystal, maybe like, you know, two feet tall or something. Rough, rough crystal kind of rotating with the light shining through it. And, uh, then this very, very kind of the mystical, nice voice comes on and says, uh, three gods rule the universe. Three. <laughs> he said, first there's Brahma, the creator. And then there's Shiva, the destroyer, who is always present at the end of things. And the third, the Vishnu, is unique because it's he who maintains the worlds. And when they're threatened with destruction, as they are now, you know, Vishnu incarnates. And some say he incarnated as Krishna. And the music, music goes on like that, you know. Yeah. This is how we remember. We remember through emotions as, as, as animalistic guys. So, 
There it is. There it is. 20th century, you know, 21st century uh, intelligent guy from a world point of view and still presenting this idea and still maybe he has it. You know? Then he goes on about, you know, Krishna incarnating. And also there's also this Japanese uh, Indian cooperation for the Ramayan. was a cartoon. Same thing. You know, Vishnu incarnated as Ram. And when everything was over, Sita returned to the earth. And Ram returned to the heavens, heavens like that, <laughs> to be, I guess, to be absorbed in the impersonal Shantara's bliss, you know, so on. Yeah. So it's, Papa says, a general understanding, you know. And this is the fifth canto, too. And so Papa's already had a lot of contact with Western people, and he's seen, like, what his audience is thinking about. And it seems that. You know, to a large degree, he's not focusing on an audience of unenlightened people. You know, for them, there, there's kirtan and prasadam, right? For them, there's kirtan and prasad. And then for people a little bit more intellectual, you know, Lord Chaitanya's philosophy, then there's Bhagavad Gita level of discussion, which is Gita Upanishad. And rational discussions, uh, some Vedic authority, okay? And for some people, then we go more, more intimately into the higher cantos of the Bhagavatam and these more personal relationships and stuff. You know? So yeah, if you do that, then you're going to start coming in contact with these general ideas that the world, the Vishnu culture, the Indian culture is dealing with Trimorti. The next slide here, number 14. You know, here's two Krishnas. If you look on the internet, the, uh, it'll, it'll come up as uh, Sri Morti. Sri Morti. And then we see very modern pictures. I guess these are maybe the Tirtan cars, you know, worshiping Sri Morti and Jain, Jain philosophy. And the right hand side, we have a picture of uh, uh, Brahma, uh, Vishnu, and Shiva. Like that. Okay. So this, this is the question, you know. You see how it's a, a pretty, uh, pretty common question, a pretty good question you know, about the, the, the situation of Lord Brahma. You know. And Mars Pariksit, my goodness, he's such an elevated person. You know. He knows, he, he learned all these things. First off, he's in a culture where from his birth he has these abilities. We heard that from what John Nimas said, the prophet said, if... Um, if you follow the principles I'm giving you strictly, and your children follow them, then your grandchildren will be traveling on flying carpets. And even I've seen, even like the kids, of this you know, first generation, uh, second, you know, ki kids of devotees, they're so different in many qualities like that. Automatically, they have so many much finer qualities. And so you're born with an ability of, to appreciate different subtle forces and manipulate them. Of course, they had this karate training for for one year, for 400 hours of dealing with prana, and you begin to appreciate. Yeah, I can, I can, I can become aware of these things. I can sense these things. I can feel these things. And of course, as devotees, also probably we should be becoming more conscious of the prana moving in the body and, and and all these different kinds of forces. And so then we can begin to appreciate that. Yeah, there is a Brahma, and he's a very tangible person. And my my level of for example, I've heard the Prabhupada says that Mormons are worshiping Lord Brahma, and I did some some program of study, you know, with them, uh, and so forth, so on. And yeah, there's so many citations. It seems that they talk about the Supreme Lord, the, you know, the Supreme Controller, but their level of worship is pretty much, you know, focusing on a realization of that Supreme Lord as, as Lord Brahma, like that. You know? And we had an interfaith dialogue uh, last week, very good, very intelligent imam from our local mosque came. He's actually from Egypt as a PhD. And he's been through a lot of sagratan here, you know, dealing with Western people in the, the Mid-South here. So it, it turned out to be a very, very nice, nice dialogue and very interesting and very, you know, very exciting. I was asking him what the, uh, the namaz prayers are. It's five times a day they have to pray. And uh, takes at least five minutes. So it's going to be you know, at least, they, they, they do at least like uh, 25 minutes, say 30 minutes of Krishna Kata every day. So he chanted them in, in Arabic and very beautiful, and gave the translations, which were very nice. Also, you know, 
but he, they had a description. They have a conception of God and this and that. And he's an honest guy. And so sometimes people were asking questions, devotees, and he was actually kind of like filling it in as best he could. And, and many times they say, well, does Allah have a form and this and that? And after you die and go to one of the different heavens, can you be elevated later on? And he was kind of uh, taken aback for words or, or scriptural sources. But then he would say, oh, God is all perfect. Okay, so therefore this must mean that and this and that. And this. So he had a certain conception that he was falling back on. And so the same way, our own japa, our own activities, you know, how much do we appreciate, really appreciate, are, are, the, Lord, are, the, are the holy names that we've received from a parampara, from Srila Prabhupada, are they non-different than Krishna? Or, or are they some symbol like that? When, when you offer the bread and the wine in the, the communion, one group, one group of people talk, talk about, what's the word, transubstantiation, and the other group talks about something else, trans something else. One says it becomes a, a respectable symbol you know, of the body and blood. Another one says it actually becomes the substance itself. It no longer is wine and bread, it is the blood and the body of Christ. Like that. This is interesting, drinking the blood of the lamb. Yeah. So this is, this is not a matter, you can talk about it and put it all in place in terms of like some kind of Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings, you know, cosmology or orcs or something, you know, the mythical creatures or ideas. You can do that. And, you know, but here we're talking about actually experiencing this. And by the fifth canto with all this cosmology, you know, Mars Parikha says, yeah, I want to understand these things because I want to see the glories of God and how he's manifest in this world in these different ways. You know? So he has a very, 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 very intense, you know, emotional uh, reason for asking all these questions in the fifth canto. He's going to die in seven days. He's not wasting his time. He's looking for things that's really interesting to to actually purify him, so he can get a get a real connection with Krishna. Then he'll be ecstatic at every moment in his his personal life. And then when the snake bird bites him, it won't, won't really bother him. <laughs> bites his body. Because by the end, he'll just see his body for what it is. It's a passing, you know, passing step on the road. Okay. So, okay, this guy, our, our little uh, appreciation. In the next slide here of the, uh, the verse. So, any questions or comments? Anybody has? Complaints? Uh, Maharaj, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Hi, Krishna. Nandarats. Anyway, thank you for a very nice slideshow and uh, class. Um, <clears throat> a couple of points. You go, uh, this? You go Sako. Sako it was the Japanese man that did the Ramayan animation. And uh, even the government of India, when he approached them, uh, they, their response was... Uh, you know, the Ramayana is Ram is not a cartoon. You know, they they didn't like the idea of an animation, and then uh, his idea was to promote Ram as an action hero. And uh, there's a lot of, although he had some Indian artists working along with some Japanese artists. And 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 illus the illustrations, the animation was cutting edge at the time. I mean, artistically, there was some merit to it, but uh, you know, it was it's sad that that presentation and other presentations are you know you know not up to the mark. And and as far as Brooks, um, I couldn't even watch it. Uh, uh, you know, he said he studied the Mahabharata for 20 years, and then he cast Beam, Bhishma, Grandfather Bhishma, as a skinny black man. And uh, but there were that—that's just where it begins. I mean, it's, it, it, it just points to the idea this Brahma Mahesh Vishnu, this you know thing that you pointed out about the Hindus accepting them as the gods rather than having a clear understanding of tattva, Vishnu tattva, Jiva tattva, you know, Brahma is Jiva tattva. 
Yeah, and Shiva is his own tattva. You know, yeah, Shiva tattva is not so easy. But um, the idea that you need a spiritual master is, you know, clear when you see people in the academic community or the artistic, you know, the creatives outside of uh, the line trying to represent something they really don't have access to. In the beginning, uh, Prabhupada told the um, Back to Godhead, Jadarani wanted to have cartoons, comic book leelas, and Prabhupada said no. They will think he is, Krishna is an imaginary character. There's a terrible noise. Yeah, I don't know where that's coming from. Yeah. Did anybody hear that? Prabhupada said, do not make Krishna comic books. I, I can't hear this. Okay. I guess Ramananda just got it. He just corrected it. He said, do not make Krishna comic books, because they will think Krishna is an imaginary character or is some kind of... Uh, yeah, fairy tale. Yeah. Like he's a fairy tale. Mythology. Yeah. The other word is this transubstantiation, and then they have transconstantiation. I don't know the meaning of that one either. Do you? Um... No, I think what, what, one I think is a substantiation. The idea is it becomes the substance itself. Yeah. Why did it become the substance? And the other one is that it becomes a symbol, like that. You know, which which you, you can't mess around with either, like that. But it's just a whole different thing, and not the same thing. But it's very very respectable. And so it's a question with us with prasadam too, is how it becomes transcendental. Yeah. 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 But in any case, the um, you know the, the general. General questions, I guess, go over here. Is that I can just read those real quick. I've got a couple of minutes here. So the king said, I wish to know narrations about the Lord, 2 8. And he describes the glories of the thing. Then he says, um, Okay, persons who wish to the sound incarnation, the pure devotee. Ah, oh yeah, 2 7 it starts. O oh, learned Brahman, the transcendental spirit soul is different from the material body. Okay, we're starting off with that thing. We're not going to ask about that. Does he acquire the body accidentally or by some cause? Can you explain this to me. 288. If the Supreme Lord from whose abdomen the lotus stem sprouted, is possessed, okay, that's the section we're talking about now. So he talks about Lord Brahma. Then uh, 210. Please also explain the personality of Godhead who, who lies in every, in every heart as the super soul and is the Lord of all energies, but is untouched by his external energy. So he's talking then about, about part of the Paramatma position of the Lord, that, that aspect of the Lord. So does the living entity become entangled in the material world uh, by some accident, or is there a cause for it? Okay. And then the Lord who's actually here is the Paramatma. So I guess he's already starting with the assumption that this is, his audience already understands the Paramatma. 2.8.11 O Lord Brahmana, it was formally explained that all the planets of the universe with their respective governors are situated in the different parts of the gigantic body of the Virat Purusha. I have also heard that the different planetary systems are supposed to be in the gigantic body of the Virat Purusha. What is your actual position? Will you please explain that. Of course, this goes on in the uh, third canto a couple times. And then... In the fifth canto, of course, is he, he asks again, give me details and exact measurements. You know? So he has a lot of uh, knowledge, a lot of desire for precise knowledge of, of the universe in a very but scientific sense that Krishna will stand up to a very, very scientific understanding and actually it will be fruitful for us. 2A12. Also, please explain the duration of time between the creation and annihilation and that of other subsidiary creations, as well as the nature of time, indicated by the sound of past, present, and future. Also, please explain the duration and measurement of life of the different living beings, known as demigods, human beings, etc., in different planets of the universe. 2.13. 
O purest Brahmanas, please also explain the cause of the different durations of time, both short and long, as well as the beginning of time following the course of action. So, of course, translating these into English, we're probably losing quite a bit here, you know, with the words, the, co the course of action and things like that. 2814. Then again, kindly describe how the proportionate accumulation of the reactions resulting from different modes of material nature act upon the desiring living being, promoting or degrading him to different species of life, beginning from the demigods down to the most insignificant creatures. 15. O best of Brahmanas, please also describe how the creation of the globes throughout the universe, mm -hmm. the four directions, Please also describe how yeah, the globes throughout the universe, the four directions of the heaven, the sky, the planets, and the stars, the mountains, the rivers, the seas, and the islands, as well as the different kinds of inhabitants, takes place. Of course, Fifth Canto goes into so much details of the dweepas and, and the barshas. Also, please describe the inner and outer space uh, of the universe by the specific divisions, as well as the character and activities of the great souls, and also the characteristics of the different classifications of caste and orders of social life. So, so far we haven't had much description of the psychological world. Yeah. 17. Please explain all the different ages and the duration of the creation, and also duration, the duration of such ages. Also tell me about the different activities of the different incarnations, of the Lord in different ages. Okay, that sounds to be more interesting because it's more personal. Mm -hmm. So far, so much is just simply based upon time and uh, and uh, space. 18. Please also explain what may generally be the common religious affiliations of human society, as well as their specific occupational duties in religion, the classification of the social orders, as well as the administrative royal orders and the religious principles for one who may be in distress. Okay, so some Varna Ashram. 19, kindly explain all about the elementary principles of creation, the number of such elementary principles, their causes, and their, deve and their development, and also the process of devotional service and the method of mystic powers. Okay, so now we're getting into higher, more subtle things. Number 20, what are the opulences of the great mystics? Oh, okay. And what is their ultimate realization? How does the perfect mystic become detached from the subtle astral body? Okay, psychology. What is the basic knowledge of the Vedic literatures, including branches of history and the supplementary Puranas? 21, please explain unto me how the living beings are generated how they are maintained, and how they are annihilated. Tell me also the advantages and disadvantages of discharging devotional service under the Lord. What are the Vedic rituals and injunctions of the supplementary Vedic rites? And what are the procedures of religion, economic development, and sense gratification? And finally, please also explain how, merged in the body of the Lord, living beings are created and how the infidels appear in the world. Also explain how the unconditioned living entities exist. So it's going a little bit to the psychological level. It's going to the point of liberation, there's questions. But then the questions that the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu deals with in terms of all these levels, because it will say in the Bhagavatam so many times a person was experiencing this or that, you know, Sattvic Bhava and different, mm -hmm. different things like that, symptoms, you know. But there's not much explanation or systematic organization. So we begin to appreciate then that Lord Chaitanya at uh, Dash Ashramita Gat, he then instructed Goswami ten days uh, on the uh, on this whole thing and gave him a fantastic you know, basis that Rupa Goswami then expanded into nectar of the world. Vidagda, I think it's you, your microphone here. Getting all kinds of scratching noise. Oh, somebody's microphone is bouncing all around. 
Yeah, there we go. Okay, thanks. It's a Chutananda Prabhu. There oh, Chutananda. Okay, he's inconceivable. <laughs> he's in ecstasy. Okay. Yeah. So then we, uh, the Rupa Goswami received all these instructions from Lord Chaitanya. And later, of course, right after that, it's chapter 19, then 20 through 23, I think is then uh, a 24, is the instructions to Sanatana Goswami. So we see Lord Chaitanya is an incredible genius. He took all this information from different sources and then presented you know, these levels. Because most incarnations, they just they resolve the problems for the demigods and get things back on, on order. And some incarnations give liberation to people. But, but you know, the Mo Mahabharanyaya, you know, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is giving in a very clear fashion, you know, scientific fashion, acceptable practical fashion, you know, Krishna Prema. And of course, he did that in Power Rupa Goswami and to books such as, especially, you know, Bhakti Rasamita Sindhu, he goes to and systematically describes the preliminary, preliminary processes of purification. And after that, that one can, by, by Sadhu Sangha, as the most one very potent process, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, worshiping the deity, accepting Guru, you know, uh, in Chaitanya's line. And then we can actually begin to come to this level of, you know, Raganuga Bhakti, and then uh, Bhava Bhakti. And then beyond that, we have a whole, now a whole process for cultivating it. You know, what's the, to, 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 you know, details of cultivating the Bhava Bhakti process up to the full level of Prema Bhakti. And then Prema Bhakti, he's going in more than that, even the, just the five, five principal rasas. And then in Madhurya Ras, there's some explanation and stimulation for that. And of course, Ujwala Nilamani, he gave even more details then, so on. You know, so such an incredible uh, religious culture, and of course, it's an opportunity to actually progress on it, to actually follow it. You know, and don't don't lose out. <laughs> like Truth of Mars, I say, don't mi- don't lose out, don't miss the chance. You know, and even the demigods are trying to take advantage of this. Otherwise, you maybe take birth in a, you know some sampradaya again, where there's only knowledge of the opulences of Ram, because Ram is getting you know rasa opportunity above Vaikuntha, but not as high as Dwarka. You know? So such a, such an opportunity we have like that. You know? So any, any kind of final questions or comments here? We're all fixed up for the day here to go out and do our Upanishadic work. Maharaj? Ah. Yeah, always Mr. Prabhupada. Thank you very much for a nice class. Uh, these questions are answered in the next two chapters or in the... Talking. Who, who, who's talking? Who are you? Harsh from Bombay. Oh, Harsh, okay. <laughs> okay, so these questions are answered in the next two chapters or the whole cantos of Hamilton? That's a good question. <laughs> that's, that's kind of what I said earlier. Is that, you know, I, I, we've been through this so many times and the structure's coming out, but I, I'm, I'm kind of interested how much of the, uh, the questions are answered in the next two things. The first question, of course, is how did Narada Muni explain it? So the purport probably says that'll go, that'll, that'll go on for, the, all, all, for many more cantos like that. So at least to that extent, you know, it's not all explained in the next two chapters. And at the end of the second canto, uh, the sages are hearing Sudha Goswami talk and they say, oh, this is very nice, you know. But what is, what, you mentioned that Maitreya met with Vidura and had a discussion. After Maitreya had heard from, from Krishna, you know, the Uddhava, he was pre- preaching to Uddhava, and Maitreya heard this also. So because until this point, all we're hearing about is pretty much Mahavishnu and how Brahma saw him, you know, and that will be described. So the sages, they want to understand Krishna's position in Dwarka because, because they think that maybe Krishna is not a, a, a lesser incarnation of Mahavishnu, the, the Hindu love god. So they want to hear this higher knowledge. So at the end of the second canto, they ask about that. And so in the third canto, that starts to come out. You know? So I would say just in general that a lot of it's answered, but a lot of it's also not answered, you know, and there'll be more more detailed questions and stuff. Stay tuned. Don't go away. Stay with the Bhagavatam class for the rest of your life. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Prabhupada says you only take birth in India if you're interested in spiritual life in your last lifetime. Okay. Of course, you can also... Can you hear me okay? No.